is resumed. It is time for question time. Questions to the Minister of Justice. And I, uh, before we commence, I have to inform the members that question two and question 13 have been withdrawn. I call Mr. Gerard Diver. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. Principal Deputy Speaker, as a result of the incident at Londonderry Courthouse on the 23rd of December, an independent review of security was commissioned by the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service. This review was carried out in consultation with the police and prison service. Members will understand that it would not be appropriate for me to discuss the outcome of the review, but I can reassure the House that the security arrangements in place at courthouses are kept under review and subject to regular inspection. Mr. Deborah, for a supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker. Obviously, this was an incident that got considerable media coverage and I think has to be a matter of uh, concern for the general public. Uh, I just wondered, I know the Minister said he is uh, abound by the review and what's happening there, but are there lessons that he thinks, in general terms, that could be learned from an incident of this nature? Well, Mr. Dever is certainly correct that there are always lessons to be learned from an incident such as this. Um, they may relate to the physical fabric of courthouses and other places of concern. They may re uh, be an issue for the management of individuals coming into those places, and there does seem to be perhaps slightly more on the second point than on the first in this case. Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, would the Minister agree that it's one thing for uh, a high profile escape such as this uh, to occur, but for it to occur on television makes things even more difficult both for him and the prison service? Can he assure the general public that in future, if there are high risk prisoners going into either Londonderry Courthouse or any other court in Northern Ireland, that the public will not be put at risk as a result of a person being able to escape from lawful custody? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'll repeat again to Mr Campbell that certainly the lessons will be learnt from this issue. Just to make one particular point, he referred to the prison service. There was no direct prison service involvement in this particular issue. Mr Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the uh, Minister for his answers to date. Uh, whatever the assessment made, and uh, Mr Dever has outlined the, the concern, particularly in Derry in relation to this, I think it's important that whatever the outcome is that we don't turn our courthouses into fortresses. I think that, that the idea of them being open and, and people seeing them as open should, should not be reversed. Well, again, uh, Mr McCartney makes a valid point. One of the key issues about justice is that it must be seen to be done. That is, of course, one of the advantages of some of our more modern courthouses, that because they've been constructed in more recent times, uh, it's easier to manage the security of prisoners arriving to somewhere different than a yard effectively all but open to public view in Bishop Street, as is the case in London Derry Courthouse. And that is an issue which clearly does not arise in some of our more modern facilities like Lagonside or indeed some of the other smaller courthouses. Well, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, given the circumstances of this particular case, uh, very unfortunate circumstances where a prisoner is seen to be legging it on, on uh, television, national television. Could the Minister assure us that the review that's been undertaken will cover all aspects of the work of prison service, court service and indeed PSNI? Well, yes, I can certainly give that assurance to the House, um, not just to Mr Kennedy. I suppose it should have taken up when Mr Campbell asked earlier. Um, the, the issue of uh, television coverage didn't, con you know, didn't make any difference to the unfortunate nature of the incident. It merely made it more public. But the lessons are being learned and would have been learned whether or not we had the benefit of a UTV camera in Bishop Street that day. Well, Mr. Barry McElduff. Number three, Kesht Ever a three. The Oma Street Safe project is one of a number of initiatives delivered by Fermanagh and Oma Policing and Community Safety Partnership, which contributes to improving community safety in the nighttime economy in Oma Town Centre. Violent behaviour in and around pubs and clubs on weekend nights presents a significant problem for public health, criminal justice and town centre management. There are many factors that influence off offending in the nighttime economy, such as substance misuse, overcrowding, permissive social environments and competition for limited fast food and transport facilities. These factors lead to difficulties in isolating any one factor which impacts on improving community safety. It is clear that interventions facilitated by the Oma Street Safe volunteers 
such as offering advice, support and a place of safety for the most vulnerable, play an important role in diffusing potentially dangerous and serious situations. The OMA Street Safe volunteers and similar schemes such as street pastors are excellent examples of local people identifying a local problem, devising a solution that is valued by its beneficiaries and actively participating in its implementation and delivery. Can I thank the Minister for his answer and for his personal and his department's interest in Omer Safer Streets project to date? Can I ask the Minister to detail perhaps the extent and type of support, uh, financial and otherwise, which his department will provide in the 2016-2017 year? And I do want to take this opportunity also to commend those civic-minded volunteers who week in, week out, show such commitment in OMA, and I believe their efforts have contributed to the saving of lives. Well, I certainly would endorse the comments that Mr McElduff in praising those volunteers who carry out such work. Um, he, of course, as an MLA for West Tyrone, will praise the volunteers in OMA. I'll praise all of those in similar schemes in every part of Northern Ireland. Um, when he speaks uh, specifically about the issue of funding, members will be well aware of the difficult funding situation that we are in at the moment. Um, nonetheless, I'm happy to say that we were able to ensure that for the remainder of this financial year, the relevant PCSP budgets have been restored. And we are doing our best to ensure that the frontline work of PCSPs is protected to a degree next year and will certainly receive less of a reduction than expenditure within the core department. One of the other key issues as well is the Assets Recovery Community Scheme, which has contributed to some of these schemes, uh, for example, in providing equipment uh, uh, where for the, uh, the volunteers to identify them and a variety of different small measures in which assets recovered have been put to good use in helping fight this kind of crime and antisocial behaviour. Mr Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And to follow on from what Mr McElduff has said, I too would like to commend uh, the great efforts made by those volunteers in Oma and indeed the many other areas across Northern Ireland that contribute a great deal of time and effort to ensuring that the public are safe. But can I ask the Minister uh, what plans uh, there is with his department to roll the scheme out in other areas across West Rhone and throughout the North? Well, can I welcome Mr McCross to his first justice question time. Um, say, it's not really an issue for my department to have plans to roll out the scheme, because this is a scheme which was devised locally, supported by the PCSP, and funded in part uh, through PCSP funding and assets funding from my department. Uh, so all I can do is encourage local people finding local solutions to problems such as this, but I certainly would do that because I think it's one of those issues where good work being done in a number of schemes could well be replicated in other parts of Northern Ireland, and I certainly would be keen to see the Department supporting it as best we can. Well, Mr Ross Hussey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Again, like the Minister, uh, I welcome all these people that involve themselves as volunteers in such uh, roles. In OMA, particularly, obviously, we have concerns, and the people there do an excellent job. Can the Minister advise the House what training the volunteers are provided through PCSPs and perhaps other agencies? Well, again, Principal Deputy Speaker, it's a bit like the answer I've just given Mr. McCrossan. The issue as to how the individual schemes are run is an issue for each individual scheme with the support from the local PCSP. The Department does not prescribe what should happen. But one of the key issues which we're able to address through the PCSP managers uh, network is the sharing of good practice to ensure that people learn of how other people have run schemes if they're intent on setting up a scheme uh, such as Safer Streets and to ensure that we use the expertise which is being built up in different parts of Northern Ireland for the benefit of every part. Not that I tell people what they must do, but that my department encourages people to learn best practice from each other, and that is what I think is contributing to such successes. Ms. Rosie McCorley. Can I ask, uh, thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And can I ask the Minister if he can outline the role of the PCSPs in bringing together a strategy to tackle rural crime? I'm slightly lost, Principal Deputy Speaker. I have questions on rural crime later in, uh, in the listing. I'm not sure in the context of the sort of work which is done uh, relating to the nighttime economy in our town centres, I really ought to go into rural crime at this point. 
come Mr Sean Rogers. My department's community safety strategy contains a commitment to make Northern Ireland, including rural communities, safer by reducing the opportunities to commit crime. The Department of Justice works closely with the PSNI, NFU Mutual, the Ulster's Farmers Union and DARD through the Rural Crime Partnership to deliver on this commitment. The partnership receives detailed quarterly updates from the PSNI Statistics Branch on levels of agricultural and rural crime. This allows key stakeholders to continue to monitor crime trends and to allocate resources accordingly. I welcome the fact that agricultural-based crime has shown an overall downward trend since 2010-11, when 937 offences were recorded. At 626, the level in the 12 months from October 2014 to September 2015 is the lowest recorded. The work of the Rural Crime Partnership has resulted in the development and delivery of a range of initiatives which aim to tackle rural crime, for example, the provision of a funding package to encourage farmers in theft hotspots to fit security devices to their machinery. We will soon pilot with Armar, Banbridge and Craig Avon, PCSP, the use of a forensic marking scheme to help prevent and detect theft from farms. I understand that Newry, Morn and Down, PCSP, has undertaken a number of initiatives to address rural and agricultural crime including the delivery of a freeze branding initiative aimed at tackling livestock theft, the distribution of guard cams to farms and homes in rural and isolated areas, and trailer marking. Rogers for supplementary. I thank the Minister for, the, for his answer and what he's there is very, very welcoming. But when, when crime occurs, particularly in rural areas, in, in, in addition to affecting the livelihood of the person concerned, it can create a terrible sense of fear in the, in, in the local community. What is being done to address that fear, and in particular, uh, what is being done to showcase uh, instances when police are successful in tackling rural crime? Well, I appreciate Mr Rogers' point that sometimes the fear of crime is significantly more uh, to be concerned about than the actual likelihood of it. Specifically on the question of what is being done to, uh, to highlight successes by the police, that is really, to some extent, an issue for the police service to do. Um, I certainly know that most uh, local papers seem to have fairly good coverage of courts in their areas when we get to the point of convictions. But it is also an issue of ensuring that the kind of work which is being done generally under the community safety strategy, highlighting the issues of community safety and fighting crime and fear of crime at that low level are also important to ensure that people do not get unnecessarily fearful, whilst clearly we want to encourage people to take appropriate levels of concern uh, to ensure that they protect themselves and their property as appropriate. But it is a matter, as I've said, that although there have been a number of incidents, we have seen a significant reduction, and I believe that has been brought about by the good partnership working we've seen across a number of agencies. Well, Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, as a representative of the neighbouring constituency, rural constituency of Upper Ban, is the Minister aware of the rise of crime increase increasing crime along their one dual carriageway corridor and can explain to the House what strategy is being employed to address what is a very long term problem for people living in both South Down and Upper Van? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I thought when I included Amar Banbridge and Craig Avon, PCSP, I would at least have covered something for, for members from Upper Van. Uh, the reality is that we will at times see hot spots in criminal activity and those can come and go at relatively short notice. The specific issue as to how we address that kind of criminal activity is an issue for the Chief Constable and not for the Minister of Justice. The responsibilities the Department has is to support efforts aimed at fighting crime and the fear of crime by bodies like PCSPs and others they work in partnership with. And I have visited most of the PCSPs at different times over the last few years, seen a variety of different work going on, and a lot of that is around the importance of prevention as opposed to dealing with crime after it has happened. Ms. Bronwyn McGoggin. The Sijini report recognises the significant progress that has been made in recent years and the challenging operational environment within which implementation has been achieved. However, it is clear from both Sijini's assessment and my department's that more still needs to be done which is why in May 2015, I commissioned a scoping study of children in or on the fringes of the youth justice system. This work is being undertaken with the aim of making improvements across the whole of the system to deliver greater benefits for children and improving their long-term outcomes. 
It will build on many of the procedural and structural changes already achieved to implementation of the review recommendations, and Sir Ginny has welcomed the scoping study as a means of furthering progress on youth justice issues. There will be a particular focus on those complex cross-cutting recommendations where cooperation and partnership across organisations and departments are necessary. Commitment from both within and beyond the criminal justice system has been evident from the start of the scoping study, with key stakeholders fully engaged at both steering group and subgroup level. I am therefore confident that we can achieve significant progress in delivering on the remaining youth justice review recommendations, either directly or indirectly, through this work. I thank the Minister for his response. Does the Minister find it <clears throat> most concerning that the Criminal Justice Inspector have stated that there has been a loss of momentum in the implementation of the recommendations of the Youth Justice Review? Well, Ms McGahan correctly highlights the concern which would be the case if there was a complete loss of focus on those issues, as opposed to potential slight loss of momentum. Part of that, because of the issue of looking at some issues in rather greater detail than had been the case, and taking a slightly longer timescale, for example, as we see in the context of statutory time limits, where the legislation was more complex than was initially believed, and where therefore it was necessary to take a longer time in order to get it right. But I do think that there is a, a degree of progress being made despite all the pressures the department is under, and I think we will see those coming through in the coming months. Mr. Alban McGinn. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. But there is a problem here that uh, the implementation of the review, uh, the Youth Justice Review, really uh, has slowed down. And I would agree with the last speaker that there seems to be a loss of momentum <laughs> with 40% of the recommendations outstanding. Now, one aspect of it is the uh, youth engagement clinics. And there was uh, contained within that uh, an attempt at least to have legal representation for young people at those clinics. And that so far really has not been achieved. And it is a serious situation where somebody goes through a clinic without legal representation and then gets what is effectively a criminal record. Uh, would the minister ask the member to come to his question? <laughs> Thank you. Would the minister apply his mind uh, to uh, guaranteeing that, in fact, such representation uh, would be achieved by young people? Well, if I could briefly refer to, to one of the points that was made um, when Mr. McGuinness referred to 40% of the recommendations not implemented. Of course, um, it is the case that some of the recommendations require. Uh, agreement beyond the criminal justice system, including agreement within this assembly. Um, if Mr. McGuinness can assist me in persuading certain members of this House to agree to raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility, it will help us make progress on that. But he does make a perfectly valid point around the issue of legal advice around the youth engagement clinics. And there are concerns on that which have been expressed. Certainly, efforts are made at every stage of the process to ensure that children and young people are made aware of the position, including the implications of decisions they take, uh, and to ensure that that is done in a way which uses child-appropriate language. But there are um, issues which are still under consideration as to exactly how that is best done. Well, Mr. Ian Milne. Sure, we've got the case of Rishi, question number six. Given the importance of the reinspection of McGabry Prison, I spoke to the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland during that process. As members will be aware, the reinspection was completed on the 15th of January. I have not spoken to Mr. McGuigan since then, and I await the publication of the report. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his question thus far. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm disappointed that there is no contact, you know, since uh, the 15th of January, I think you said, right? Uh, since that report, but uh, I would like to ask the Minister then, uh, does he agree that uh, when the Director General stated at a recent uh, Justice Committee meeting uh, that there was tensions between her office and senior management in McGabry, and that it led to a situation where instructions were ignored, and as a result, the prison regime was disrupted? Would the Minister agree with 
uh, the Director of Prisons. Good. Well, on, the, on Mr. Milne's first point, I'm not sure, having spoken to Mr. McGuigan uh, while the second week of the inspection was underway, I'm not sure the fact I haven't spoken to him in another 10 days since when the expectation it will, it will take in the region of three to four weeks for his report to come out is anything which is particularly a fault of mine. In terms of the issues which he highlighted, the Director General's reference to relationships between prison headquarters and the previous senior management team in McGabry, clearly that is an issue of concern. That is one of the issues that was addressed by the refreshment of the senior management team. Mr. Adrian Cochran Watson. Well, Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the Minister update the House when he last met the Prison Officers Association about staffing at McGabry? And does the Minister consider McGabry as providing a safe working environment for prison staff? Well, I can't off the top of my head, Principal Deputy Speaker, tell the House when I last met the Prison Officers Association to discuss McGabry, but I can say it was shortly after they last requested to meet me to discuss such issues. Um, on the issue as to whether McGabry is providing a safe environment at the moment, um, I certainly believe from the conversations I've had with a number of people that the situation in McGabry is now better than it was. But if I said anything more than that, I'd be coming perilously close to second guessing the official report of criminal justice inspection. And I think I and the House should wait for that to come out within the next two or three weeks. Well, Mr. Patsy McLuhan. Yeah. Colonel McGuire, for your last count, Coyle. Thanks very much, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker. Um, I sat through a recent uh, evidence hearing at the at the Justice Committee. Whenever we heard that there, were, there appeared to be major communications deficits between senior management and indeed members of the the POA, the Prison Officers Association, uh, can the Minister advise if he or his office have taken any measures to enhance or improve that? Uh, there just seemed to be, on the basis of what we heard very limited, if any, communication, particularly around the previous report into the prison. Well, Mr. McGlone raises an interesting point, but the, the only bit that I can think of relating to the POA and the previous report was the fact that the three representatives of the POA who came to the committee admitted they hadn't read the report, which made it somewhat difficult for them to discuss the contents of the report. Uh, I do not meet uh, any of the unions which represent staff uh, within uh, the justice family or indeed bodies like the police federation unless I'm requested to. I meet them when I'm requested and I haven't had a request from the POA. My understanding is that there will be regular ongoing discussions within each of the three institutions between the POA and management staff as is appropriate dealing with issues of concern there. But it is very difficult for the minister to know exactly what the state of discussions with the POA is when he isn't actually invited or requested to meet them. Mr. Stewart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for the, the answers which you've given to us. Minister, there are those who may say that since the devolution of policing and justice, that prison reform hasn't worked or has been particularly slow uh, in the light and in the wake of the recent report. But what assurance can you give to this House that indeed that prison reform is on track and that you and your department can deliver a prison service uh, fit for today and for the future? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I believe if we look back at what has been achieved since the prison uh, review team reported, we can report very significant achievements, notwithstanding that one report on the Gabri prison in May of last year clearly uh, highlighted issues of concern. We have seen major changes in terms of the refreshing and retraining of staff, um, the work being done which has transformed Hyde Bank Young Offender Centre into Hyde Bank Wood College the first such transformation anywhere in the UK. Uh, we've seen a very positive inspection of McGilligan Prison. Uh, we've seen work being done on uh, step-down houses for both men reopening Burren House on the Cromlin Road and women on the Hyde Bank site. Uh, we have detailed plans subject to capital expenditure available from DFP. Um, a very significant uh, effort being done in terms of education in consultation with Belfast Met and Northwest Colleges. So there are very significant achievements, and indeed just this morning I visited McGilligan Prison where I saw good work being done which is being used to educate young people from schools in the Northwest area into the Holocaust when we think that Wednesday is Holocaust Memorial Day. Prisoners who in their own time did paintings, various bits of artwork, 
Um, in one case, an old Nissan hut which has the names of 600 people who died in various concentration camps, highlighted by prisoners putting their own effort in their own time into making that as a suitable exhibition for training young people. I think it's an example of good work which is being done, notwithstanding the challenges which were identified in McGabry last May. Mr. Dathi Mackay. Judge, question number seven. The contract for the provision of visitor centres at McGabry, McGilligan and Hyde Bank Wood was awarded to People Plus and the contract commenced on 1 December last. As was the case with previous visitor centres contracts, this tender was issued as an open bid facilitated by the Central Procurement Directorate of DFP. This was tendered in line with the Public Contracts Regulations 2015. The bids received were evaluated by an independent panel in accordance with the advertised criteria, and the most economically advantageous tender was successful. Guy for supplementary. Jeremy, I get a brief last kind of Can I ask the Minister if he could ensure that a narrow uh, interpretation of the tender specification uh, is not undertaken, uh, that that is addressed, because that has led to a reduction in services uh, which can be easily restored, especially in regard to the Car Park Visitor Centre? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, given the current financial difficulties, there was uh, a reduction in the services which were included within the tender, which has made some difference to the services which are provided, uh, because uh, the prison service, like other aspects of the Department of Justice, is under significant financial pr pressure at the present time. Um, I think Mr Mackay is hinting at some of what might have been described as the extra services which were provided by Quaker Service and by NIACRO, uh, which were in a sense voluntary activity on the part of their staff and volunteers which took the contract into a better place. Unfortunately, the rules which we are required to procure services under uh, do not easily allow to deal with those extra additional points. Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, could I ask uh, the Minister whether or not uh, there were any uh, social responsibility uh, criterion added to the uh, uh, the recruitment and selection procedure in terms of uh, uh, eligibility for application? Well, I'm not quite sure uh, what Mrs. Kelly means by, you know, by the social factors, though I, you know, I think I can guess at it. Um, my understanding is that the way in which CPD carried out its work was in accordance with the normal arrangements under which DFP operates. And I'm well aware of the concerns which have been expressed uh, by a number of people in terms of how that has perhaps seen a diminution of um, the social care aspects, if that's the best way to put it, of the work that was done. Uh, it was certainly an indication of the excellent service that was provided by Quaker Service in particular for very many years. Uh, and it's certainly an issue that I will be addressing when I meet Quaker Service representatives in the near future and discuss with them the ongoing services that they will be continuing to provide to aspects of our custodial services. Well, Mr. Ian McRae. A training needs assessment last year identified a significant reduction in the projected number of training days brought about primarily by budget reductions across the three services and the resulting impact on recruitment. In November 2015, the Programme Board delivered a revised outline business case which considers a range of options for the future delivery of service training, including basing some or all services training at Desert Creek includes a full economic appraisal of the shortlisted op options and identifies a preferred strategic option. The outlined business case has been signed off by the accounting officers of the three services and the two departments and is currently awaiting the Health Minister's approval to add to my own. I hope that we will shortly be in a position to circulate the business case to executive colleagues to enable them to take an informed strategic decision on the way forward for this project. We have time just for a quick supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his update. Um, if the Minister gets the necessary um, approvals from the, the Health Minister, um, can the Minister outline a time, timeline for this process, and um, can he foresee any possible um, difficulties? Whereas I'm not asking him to look into crystal ball. I will be very brief, then, Principal Deputy Speaker. I think projects of this size always have possible difficulties, but at this stage, the issue is for the Health Minister's approval to be given so that we can jointly present a paper to the executive which will then take decisions. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions and I call Mrs Palm Cameron.
Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister um, if he could tell us when the report into the fire at Urn House at Mugabri is due to be published? Certainly, the fire at Urn House report um, is uh, near to completion and is something which I would ex uh, expect to see published in the, in the near future. I have had a brief and informal meeting with the two governors from uh, NOMS who carried it out. And I'm assuming that the final report will be presented within the next few weeks, so it will then become possible uh, to look at the full implications of that fire and the lessons to be learned from it. Mrs Cameron for a supplementary. For his answer so far. Um, can the Minister possibly outline why it took so long for action to be taken to regain control of the block following the fire? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, Mrs Cameron is now really asking me to prejudge the outcome of a report which has been commissioned independently to ensure that neither the prison service nor the minister gives their opinion in advance of that independent uh, result coming through. Call Mr William Marvin. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Following the National and Crime Agency's approval to operate in Northern Ireland, can the minister update the House on the work of the National and Crime Agency in my own constituency of Newry and Armagh, and in particular provide an update on successes against those involved in fuel laundering and other tax evading crimes? Well, sometimes, Principal Deputy Speaker, it's not actually possible to have all the statistics in front of you that members would wish um, at a particular point. Um, if uh, Mr. Irwin has particular questions, I'll happily see that they're answered in writing later. Um, but there is no doubt the National Crime Agency is very active in Northern Ireland. It is supporting the activities of the Police Service of Northern Ireland. It also, of course, has the responsibility for uh, assets recovery, which was not previously the case, and it will be uh, uh, falling to them to carry out that kind of work in conjunction with not just the, uh, the Police Service, but also some of the other UK-wide agencies. Um, the National Crime Agency will also be playing a role uh, in the cross-border uh, task force, which was recently established, and the, the NCA, alongside Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, the Revenue Commissioners, uh, the Criminal Assets Bureau in the Republic, the Police Service will be key agents in working together in that fight against organised crime across the island. One for a supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his reply? Uh, would the Minister accept that the perception in the wider community is that many of these criminal gangs can act uh, with immunity to the law, or seeming immunity to the law? Well, I will certainly accept that there is a perception to that effect, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I think part of that perception may have been the gap before we had the National Crime Agency fully operational within Northern Ireland, but now that it is fully operational, I would hope that we will see uh, significant work stepping forward, and I hope to be meeting the new Director General in the near future, and we'll certainly be talking to her about the necessity of ensuring uh, that we get the, the best possible use of the assets that the NCA holds within Belfast <laughs> to assist a range of other bodies, both north and south, against the kind of crimes which Mr Owen is highlighting and which, in particular, some of them blanket his constituency. Well, Mr Roy Bears. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister advise if he is aware of the findings from the recent PSNI scoping exercises into the long-term plans for police stations uh, in Northern Ireland and in my East Antrim constituency in particular? The specific issue of the use of police stations, which Mr Beggs highlights, Principal Deputy Speaker, is an issue for the Chief Constable. The question of the potential disposal of unused uh, police assets also falls to the Policing Board. None of it falls to the Minister of Justice. Bags for a supplementary. <clears throat> Would the Minister agree with me that in order for justice to be administered and to be delivered, it is important that there is a police presence in large towns such as Carrick Fergus with a population of over 40,000 people, so that it does not suffer from having to be policed from neighbouring districts such as in Larne or in Ballymena? And that particularly with others trying to call themselves uh, uh, and enforcing a form of, of, of policing, that it's important that the PSNI have a presence in Carrick Fergus? Well, I think there are two different uh, points there, Principal Deputy Speaker. It is certainly important there is a police presence in every part of Northern Ireland. That does not necessarily mean a building in every part of Northern Ireland. It is important 
that the police manage the resources they have in a way which ensures the frontline policing is protected rather than preserving um, architecture across the region. Um, when he also refers to the issue of those who claim a right to police within the community, wherever they happen to be, he is absolutely right that there can be no place for those self-appointed thugs who pretend to act as if they were acting in the interest of the community, was they are largely lining their own pockets. And that is something we need to ensure it does not happen anywhere in Northern Ireland. Mr Jonathan Craig is not in his place. I call Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister uh, provide the figure of what, he, what the cost of the public purse is for providing interpreters for people who do not speak English as their first language uh, going to police stations? Uh, again, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, whilst Ministers are expected to know quite a lot for topical question time, I do not think it is realistic to expect that questions like that can be discussed. There are, I mean, when he talks about cost of interpreters, there are, of course, uh, costs in the justice system to both police station interviews and also uh, in potential court proceedings, and those are issues which are determined on the basis of the need for the individual, but I do not carry around the figures on the top of my head as to the total cost last year. Mr McRae, for supplementary. Given that other countries um, across Europe um, char or ensure that a person who is in, in a country that has not the, the language of that country, is their first language, they have to pay for um, the provision of an interpreter and they bring one with them. Um, does the Minister have a view whether that is something that should be considered for, for Northern Ireland, that those people who require an interpreter should pay to, to provide that interpreter? Well, I am not sure whether Mr McRae has had experience of having to pay for a translation into French or German or Spanish or something himself. I am um, not aware of the full pattern is across Europe. Uh, certainly the uh, the pattern of charging for interpretation services is not something which has been common to the justice system or indeed other services like the health service uh, within the United Kingdom, um, and it is not something that I have been considering to date. Mr. Ross Hussey. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Earlier, uh, Minister, we spoke about uh, the reduction in agricultural crime. Can you tell me what discussions you have had with your counterpart in the Republic of Ireland in relation to cross border agricultural crime? Well, when I meet the Irish Justice Minister, uh, which I do on a, formally on a twice yearly basis, we discuss a range of issues, um, more around the issue of organised crime and certain aspects of the way in which we can better learn lessons. Uh, for example, the last meeting had a significant presentation uh, from those running uh, victim services, both north and south. We do then under effectively any other business discuss a range of key topical issues. Uh, something like agricultural crime might well feature in that. I do not think it is actually formally featured in the agenda at any point, though it is of course an issue which is being addressed by the new cross-border task force. Uh, I have uh, passed on a request from the Minister of Agriculture that the Dard Veterinary Service would be added to the operationals group because it clearly is an issue that alongside things like food standards and food safety and environmental crime, we need to ensure that that work is done covering not just the pure criminal justice system, but a range of other issues. Mr. Hussey, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response so far. Uh, in relation to organised crime, it is believed that within the Clougher Valley area, which obviously covers my area of West Tyrone and into Fermanagh South Tyrone, it is believed that quite a few agricultural vehicles have been stolen to order, and indeed this uh, goes as far as even Castle Derg. Uh, would you, in the future, try to ensure that that particular issue is raised with your counterpart and they accept also with the Organised Crime Agency? Well, it is certainly an issue which can be highlighted if it is a key issue for ministerial attention. It is certainly an issue for operational attention, and I, I am glad that Mr Hussey recognises that particular point. It is also an issue where some of the work that we have done, for example, in promoting tracking devices on agricultural machinery uh, has helped fight uh, that kind of crime, and it is not an issue which is solely confined to the Clocker Valley. Unfortunately, we have had at times reports of tractors stolen in County Antrim appearing in County Cork. So there are, there are major challenges, but part of it is around the prevention route, just as much about the enforcement route, and the enforcement applies within Northern Ireland and cross-border. Well, Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Principal Speaker, can I ask the Minister uh, what progress is being made on resolving the dispute over legal aid between the department and the legal profession? 
Well, I'm not quite sure the, uh, the precise meaning of the term dispute, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, but in response to Mr Weir's question, um, he will be aware, as I think most of the House will be aware, that the current position is that the High Court found uh, largely in favour of the Department of Justice, apart from one minor fee for solicitors and a slight procedural issue under which Mr Justice Maguire did not strike down the rules that were made. There is a judicial review due this week. Uh, into uh, an, well, sorry, there's an appeal into the judicial review by uh, the, uh, the Bar Council, and we will have to await the outcome of that. But the reality is, we continue with the position that even after these reductions, legal aid payments in Northern Ireland remain significantly more generous for both barristers and solicitors than the payments in England and Wales, the most comparable jurisdiction. Well, Mr. Weir for supplementary. Thank the Minister for his response. Can the Minister outline what his assessment of the level of disruption that has been caused as a result of the dispute in terms of judicial proceedings? Uh, there are certainly, um, at the moment, I believe, something in the region of 800 cases awaiting for committal to the, uh, the Crown Court. Uh, given the, uh, the strike action being carried out by barristers, um, we, uh, we will see exactly how that is resolved when barristers are willing to return to work. But I know the Lord Chief Justice has made significant preparation, which has been discussed with officials in the Courts and Tribunal Service, as to how cases will be listed when that is the case. But I do believe that those who talk about their concerns for vulnerable uh, witnesses, for those who had offences committed against them, and indeed in some cases for vulnerable defendants, have an obligation to carry out their work. The Department has made it clear that in terms of the trial preparation fee, uh, any payments uh, made will be backdated to ensure that there is no reason why individuals should not return to work immediately. And we should see that carried through if people wish to see justice being done. Well, Mr Chris Lowe. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the work of the Assets Recovery Scheme Fund? But, uh, since uh, we obtained the 50 per cent of assets recovered for the Department of Justice after um, a slight disagreement with the Home Office shortly after devolution, we have distributed something in the region of £3 million to a variety of different schemes aimed at fighting crime and the fear of crime. Uh, many of them have been uh, funded through uh, partnership with PCSPs. In, in a range of areas. We have also seen work done by Youth Justice Agency, by probation, and some of my uh, direct responsible areas. All of those are key issues which have ensured that that £3 million has been put to extremely good use in fighting crime, fighting the fear of crime and antisocial behaviour, and making Northern Ireland a safer place. We have time for a brief. Uh, supplementary on the brief uh, thank, thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, welcome that £3 million has been taken out of the hands of criminals and returned to the community. And would the Minister encourage community groups to apply for the fund via the local PCSPs before the deadline of 29 January 2016? I think I could be very brief. I will just repeat the date. The 29th of January is the date for, for groups to apply through their PCSP. And certainly, um, if we can continue to take assets off criminals as successfully as we have, then I hope we will have a significant amount of money in the fund for next financial year. I call Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, uh, you will have had uh, some correspondence with regards to staff from the Legal Service Agency with regards to an issue um, in relation to the voluntary exit scheme. Can I uh, ask you, have you taken that matter up with the Minister and DFP to ensure that uh, what appears to be an anomaly will now be addressed? Well, my officials have certainly discussed the issue uh, with uh, officials in DFP. I haven't spoken directly to the Minister, but since he's sitting across the chamber now, he may know about it. Um, I think it is unfortunate that staff and legal services were not civil servants at the date when the civil service uh, voluntary early retirement scheme came into place and were civil servants by the time the opportunities came through for other public bodies. I think that is extremely unfortunate. I am told that it is the rules within DFP, but I am continuing to press on it. That concludes questions to the Minister of Justice.